welcome to my Shetland knitting class. Today we will be looking at designing feral garments and in particular focusing on my fingerless mitt which feature a folded cuff and a thumb gusset like these. But firstly I'd like to tell you a bit about myself and also about the origins of feral knitting. My name is Alison Rendell. I'm Shetland born and bred. I've lived in Shetland my whole life, um, as have my family. But then I came home after that. I grew up in the 1970s in a pre-oil industry era in Shetland, surrounded by knitters who had to supplement their income by knitting. Um, my nan in particular has been a huge influence on me. Um, she knitted all the time, selling her pillbox hats and her gloves to the local shops. I remember her getting me to do jobs when I was younger and it would involve sewing in the foam on the pillbox hats and just finishing her garments. So I've really always, knitting's always been part of my life. I still have a cherished pair of my grandmother's gloves made in the 1970s. Um, they're a little bit old now, but you can see them here. They're still beautiful and you can see how they've influenced my knitting. Both of my grandmothers knitted for local shops and my mother knitted to keep us in clothes when we were small. Even my father, who was a fisherman, was known to sit late into the night machine knitting to help out. We all, as children, wore fair Algansies to school. It was the national uniform before the lure of m more modern fabrics and fashions in the 1980s. Um, my mother knitted a fair isle yoke and a fair isle all over for, for me every year and replaced them as I, as I grew. I have no idea where all those garments have gone now. Sadly, there are none in my possession, but I do have a few photographs of me and my sister wearing my wonderful designs by my mother. And here you can see us wearing the all over and the yoke designs. At this point, I do have to say that my mother was a much better knitter than she was a hairdresser. I was taught to knit in riggies, that is garter stitch, at quite a young age. But it was only when I had fair isle lessons in primary school that I became interested in colour work knitting. I found it really exciting as a youngster watching patterns and colours emerge and it gave me the drive to see the garment to completion. It's still colour work that interests me and I find that all the beautiful shades available in Shetland wool lend themselves very well to blending and you can almost paint with wool. I made my first, I designed my first all over when I was age 17 and then I had eventually four children of my own and I probably knitted less when they were small. But it's very much again been my therapy as my children have all grown and fled the nest. Knitting also helps me to relax after a busy day in the NHS. My partner Kevin, who has an interest in Shetland traditional culture and also photography, has done a lot of photographing my designs and my work and he has encouraged me to use social media and share my knitting with others and this has led me to have an interaction with global knitting friends. I'd like to now share some of the background of the origins of Fair Isle knitting. Fair Isle is one of the Shetland Islands and it lies to the southwest of the mainland. Fair Isle knitting dates back to the 1850s and the original patterns were lozenge-shaped patterns linked by crosses. I have an example here of one of the hats I've done. Um, you can see the lozenge-shaped patterns linked by the crosses. So that's an example of, a, of an early Fair Isle pattern. Fair Isle was less isolated than you might expect in the days of ship and sail as it was a busy sea route to North America. Folk memory on the island suggests that a man, a Fair Isle man who was a sailor, travelled perhaps to the Baltic area and took back a shawl and from there the women were inspired to 
adapt some of the designs on the shawl into their knitting and that is possibly how Fair Isle Knitting started. This is well supported by some of the similarities in complexity of the designs between the early Fair Isle Knitting and some of the folk weaving in the Baltic area and Russia. The Fair Isle Knitting became more widely known in 1856 when Eliza Edmonston mentioned it in her book Sketches and Tales of the Shetland Islands. Norwegian design influence came later in the form of large stars. This happened in around World War II with the large influx of Norwegian refugees to Shetland. You can find out more about the origins of Fair Isle Knitting in Sheila McGregor's lovely book, which I have a copy here, Traditional Fair Isle Knitting, which is published in 1981. It has um, a lot of history and information in the, in the front of the book and then quite a lot of patterns dotted out in the back. So it's a good resource book. Traditional Shetland knitting is normally done without using a pattern and using a knitting belt and three or four double pointed wires. My preference is for the stainless steel ones. So we wear a belt like this around the middle and your right hand needle is secured in one of the holes and remains rigid the whole time. I believe this was very helpful for the women in the past who had to knit all the way on their feet to the peak tail and back knitting as they went and this helps to keep the knitting secure. Shetland knitting is normally done in the round enabling you to knit continuously all the way around without the need for purl on the reverse side. Purl is normally reserved for the ribbing only. I'll just show you this gansey that I made earlier. Here is an example of a garment knitted in the round with the ribbing um, at the cuffs and at the basque at the bottom. Once your tension has been worked out, you can decide how many stitches you need for the size of the garment that you require. Choose a pattern that works in the total round number of stitches so that you, your pattern works continuously all the way around the sides as well. We normally stick the arms and the neck in order to continually work in the round and these get cut later. I recommend Shetland wool. It is a lovely natural fibre, very warm in the winter time and you actually need it in Shetland summers too. There's uh, so many colours in Shetland wool available. As a general rule you need enough of a contrast so that your foreground colour stands out against your background colour but traditionally they should, the colours should blend also. I have a few more examples of garments that I've knitted in this way which I can show you now. Here is another short sleeved uh, jumper that I've made. This, I've done quite a lot of experimenting in, in the ribbing. This one I made a little pattern in the middle of the ribbing and short sleeves and the same there. I've also made a couple of tunic dresses because this is what I tend to wear is a, is a longer garment. Um, and I'll show you them as well. Here I've experimented using just little dots in the ribbon and a pattern at the bottom on this one. And in this final one I used sort of bigger squares in the ribbon. But you can see all the the number of colours used in these. So these uh, have all been made just for my own use, but each one takes three, three, certainly three or four months to make. So I tend to like to stick to smaller garments as well. So 
So for the purposes of today's class, we're going to focus on a pair of fingerless mitts like these. Fingerless mittens, otherwise known in Shetland as dags, were traditionally worn by fishermen when they were out at sea in open boats to keep their hands warm. They allow for much more functionality and dexterity of the fingers that you would not get with traditional gloves with fingers. For the purposes of this class, I will be looking at my recently released pattern on Ravelry, the Vagaland mitts, which feature both the folded patterned cuff and the thumb gusset. These mitts are made in the same style as my nan's all those years ago. She actually came from an area called Cunningsborough, where the knitters were known for their very detailed gloves and their pattern cuffs and pattern fingers also. So today I have a few of my Vagaland mitts in different colourways for you to see. They all feature the same star motif on the back of the hand and the same pattern on the cuff, but I varied it a little by doing slightly different piri patterns on the palm and slightly different thumb gussets as well. I usually do either stripes or dots. There's a few more different ideas for the palm. The folded cuff gives you the attractiveness of design on the outside, but with the benefits of the ribbing on the inside. A combination of a snug fit whilst maintaining all important pattern and design. It also gives you a comfortable and warm, double layer of warmth around the wrist. So to make them, I have uh, one I've started here. So I start with three rows of ribbon at the bottom. I then move to a piri pattern, usually a nine row pattern, but whatever your choice is for a small pattern here. And then I do three rows of stock and stitch above it. We now move to the more technical part, which is turning the cuff. To do this, you simply turn your work inside out. From here on, the wrong side now becomes the right side. And you start, let me just move that end. You start knitting back over the stitches that you've just completed, like this. So this little ridge that you create makes a perfect defining line with which to, to fold your cuff back over. You can see it better on this one. Here you have a crisp clear edge that you've made which is a, makes a natural fold for when you turn your cuff back over again. Using my Vagalin pattern you then proceed to knit 22 rows of ribbing. But in actual fact, you can knit as many rows of ribbon as your cuff length dictates. So, for example, if you choose a wider pattern here, you would just do the number of ribbing rows to match. You then proceed up your mitten until you get to the thumb stage. On the next row, we're going to increase from three to five using make one to the right and make one to the left, as shown on this reference sheet. So I'll show you how we do that on this next example. So knit across uh, your palm, following your palm pattern to begin with. Thank you. 
until you get to your three base stitches for your gusset. Now we're going to do the increasing. So make one to the right and make one to the left are very similar. They're both ways of increasing by one stitch. The only difference is that make one to the right leans to the right and make one to the left leans to the left. This is so that you get very neat and invisible increases that are not noticed up each side of the gusset. So to make one to the right, you lift the bar between the stitches from the back to the front. This can be a little bit tricky using two colours, but it's the background colour that you're looking for. Now you just need to loosen this stitch a little and knit into the front of it. as a normal knit. Go across your, your gusset and when you get to the other side, you now, we're now going to make one to the left. So what we do is we lift the bar between the stitches again, this time from the front to the back using your left hand needle. And this time we need to knit into the back of the loop. and get to the end of your row. So we've increased from three to five on the gusset. You now need to continue in this way every second row until we get to nine stitches. Then continue knitting the nine stitches until we get to about two rows before the, the middle of the pattern. So, as you can see, we've knitted up the thumb gusset with two rows before the centre stitch, the centre row of the, of the pattern, which is about the right place to sight your thumb. So, you knit until you get to your thumb gusset. And here we have the nine stitches that will be picked up later to create the thumb. So I knit these in a brightly coloured thread. I recommend a brightly coloured one so that it is much easier to see when you come to cut it out. A colour that's not already been used in the pattern. So knit them that, those nine on the brightly coloured thread and I just give it a knot at the back to make sure it stays in place. Now move these nine back onto your left hand needle. And just continue knitting over the top of, the, top of them with your palm pattern. And there you have your coloured line that will later be used to create the thumb. So continue in your palm pattern and your star pattern until you get to the top of the mitt. I tend to finish them using four rows of ribbon just before the knuckles, but you can easily change this and omit, miss out the ribbing and create fingers if this is your preference. So the next stage is creating the thumb. So I use small thin wires for this job and you need to pick up the nine stitches on either side of your brightly coloured line as I will show you now. There's 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine on the bottom, and I just do the same on the top. Black is probably the worst colour to see. Okay, once your stitches are safely on the wires, you're now able to cut out your, your bright thread. So just take your time doing this as it is a bit fiddly and you don't want to make a mistake at this point. There we go. Where we have a nice opening for our thumb and the waste yarn thrown away. So using your background colour, I usually start knitting across the, the top row first, knit across your nine, The next thing I do is just pick up one small stitch here at the corner. This helps prevent any small holes appearing at, at this side of your thumb. So just pick up one there, giving you 10 on, on each side. That's 10 on the top side and I'll do the same for the, for the bottom now. There's my nine and one more. Just so there's your thumb picked up. I now proceed to knit usually about eleven rows stock and stitch. And then I finish with three rows of rib, which takes you just to your knuckle. And then cast off in rib. And there, that's your, that should be your mitten finished. After your garment is finished, you can just wash, hand wash in mild soapy water and either give it a light spin or wrap it in a towel to remove the excess water. In Shetland, everything gets dressed on a board. We're big into boards for jumpers and gloves as well. So these are the boards that my dad made for me. So they're just a wooden shape with a thumb shape as well. And you can see the difference between a boarded glove and an unboarded one. So the boards, they stretch your knitting they make your knitting look even and very smooth and just give it shape. So once they've been dried on the boards, you can just pull them off. And what I would do now is just steam the top ribbon, 
which has become a little bit overstretched on the board, but that'll pull in again once it's been had a little steam. Oh yeah. Also, one last tip is to remember when you're making a pair is to always to reverse your thumb so that you don't end up with two left hands. To finish my lesson today, I'd like to end on a quote from a favourite Shetland poet of mine who wrote under the name of Vagaland in the 1950s and 60s. He grew up on the west side of Shetland, which is also my home. He wrote about Shetland in a vivid and insightful way, which takes me back to my childhood. My Vagaland mitts are my dedication to him. And when the hair's day's toil would slacken, folk would come in about the night, and wind and simmons spinning, macken, they sat afore the pit fire's light. So thank you very much for joining me today, and I really hope you've enjoyed today's lesson. Thanks. Thank you.